in all cases. Um, I don't believe any president, particularly when the casualty rates are very, very high, that presidents call. But I believe they're all right. So when I gave that explanation to our president three days ago, um, he elected to make phone calls in the case of the four young men who we lost in Niger uh, at the earlier part of this month. But then he said, you know, what, how do you make these calls? Uh, if you're not in the family, if you've never worn the uniform, if you've never been in combat, you can't even imagine how to make that call. But I think he very bravely does make those calls. Uh, the call in question uh, that he made yesterday, um, or day before yesterday now, were to four family members, the four fallen. And remember, there's an extra kin designated by the individual. If he's married, that's typically the, the spouse. If he's not married, that's typically the parents, unless the parents are divorced. And then he selects one of them. If he didn't get along with his parents, he'll, si he'll select a sibling. But the point is, the phone call is made to the um, the next to kin only if the next to kin agrees to take the phone call. Sometimes they don't. So a pre-call is made, the President of the United States or the Commandant of the Marine Corps or someone would like to call. Will you accept the call? And typically they all accept the call. So he called four people the other day and expressed his condolences in the best way that he could. And he said to me, what do I say? Uh, I said to him, sir, there's nothing you can do to lighten the burden on these families. But let me tell you what I tell them. And what, let me tell you what my best friend, Joe Dunford, told me, because he was my casualty officer. He said, Kel, um, he was doing exactly what he wanted to do when he was killed. He knew what he was getting into by joining the, that 1%. He knew what the possibilities were, because we're at war. And when he died, in the four cases we're talking about, Niger, my son's case in Afghanistan, when he died, he was surrounded by the best men on this earth, his friends. That's what the president tried to say to, a fam to four families the other day. I was stunned when I came to work yesterday morning and brokenhearted at what I saw a member of Congress doing. A member of Congress who listened in on a phone call from the President of the United States to a young wife and in his way tried to express that opinion. That he's a brave man, a fallen hero. He knew what he was getting himself into because he enlisted. There's no reason to enlist. He enlisted. And he was where he wanted to be, exactly where he wanted to be with exactly the people he wanted to be with when his life was taken. That was the message. That was the message that was transmitted. It stuns me that a member of Congress would have listened in on that conversation. Absolutely stuns me. And I thought at least that was sacred. You know, when I was a kid growing up, a lot of things were sacred in our country. Women were sacred and looked upon with great honor. That's obviously not the case anymore, as we see from recent cases. Life, the dignity of life, was sacred. That's gone. Religion, that seems to be gone as well. Gold Star families, I think that left in the convention over the summer. But I just thought the selfless devotion that brings a man or woman to die on the battlefield, I just thought that that might be sacred. And when I listened to this woman and what she was saying and what she was doing on TV, the only thing I could do to collect my thoughts was to go and walk among the finest men and women on this earth. And you can always find them because they're in Arlington National Cemetery. Went over there for an hour and a half, walked among the stones, some of whom I put there because they were doing what I told them to do when they were killed.